Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this flash panel by the School of History, Philosophy and Religion at Oregon State University. Um, this is our flash panel on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent war and humanitarian crisis. The School of History, Philosophy and Religion created these flash panels as a way to provide students with information and analysis about current events and important developments in the world. Our goal is to provide essential expert nonpartisan analysis of some of the most pressing issues in the world today. This is one of the most important functions of a university education and our responsibility as educators and scholars to help our students develop a more nuanced and complex way of understanding and responding to the world they inhabit, even and maybe especially when we're talking about painful topics. These are very tense times. I would remind everyone that this is an educational forum. As faculty in the liberal arts, we absolutely believe that people of goodwill can discuss sensitive issues calmly and rationally. And indeed for the health of our democracy, it is essential that we discuss difficult topics, that we apply the insights of experts to complex issues, and that we keep respect for each other in the forefront of our interactions. At the same time, the sheer magnitude and depth of human suffering happening in Ukraine right now is difficult to grasp and even more difficult to accept. As a human, as a mother, as part of a family who has a beloved family member from Dnipro, Ukraine, I found it very difficult to watch the tragedy and suffering that has unfolded in the past 11 days. And yet I felt a moral responsibility to not look away or pretend that it wasn't happening, to bear witness, even if there was little I could do to change this. To that end, Marta Kunetska, our moderator, and I have compiled a list of reputable humanitarian organizations to which you can donate if you feel compelled. Um, these are listed in the chat for you. There are of course many more angles that need to be explored. And to that end, we will have a follow-up panel in the beginning of spring term that explores issues related to warfare as it is happening now, namely nuclear conflict, humanitarian challenges, the refugee crisis and war crimes and their prosecution. Um, and also what it means to advocate for a peace in a situation of murderous aggression. As ever, we're grateful to those who have made this panel possible. Thank you to CLA Dean Larry Rogers, to Shipper Director Nicole Von Germiten, to Suzanne Giftai, Aaron Sneller, and Natalia Bueno for their support and assistance. As we discuss the invasion and displacement of sovereign people, it is important to acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Marys River and Panefu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of Silence Indians. And now to the panel itself. Each panelist will offer eight to 10 minutes or so of commentary, and then we will have time for questions. As I'm sure many of you have things you would like to discuss, we want the Q&A to be as efficient as possible. So I will ask you if you have a question, please to share it in the Q&A forum. I'm especially grateful to Sergei Greblov, a student in one of my classes who is from Kyiv, Ukraine, for being willing to share his perspective with us in a very stressful and painful moment. And finally, I would like to make a personal request of each panelist. In the time, in this time of misinformation, I'd be grateful if you each at the end of your comments identified a news source or information that you use, one that's reliable and insightful. Finally, moderating our conversation is Dr. Marta Konechka, who is a senior instructor and advisor in the School of History, Philosophy and Religion. Dr. Kuneska is not only a scholar and a teacher of political and ethical philosophy, but she's also from Poland and her family are engaged in efforts to address the refugee crisis at the border. So I will pass it over to Marta. Thank you, Amy. Uh, today marks exactly two weeks since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are all aware that uh, over 2 million Ukrainians had to flee fled their country and cross the borders to safer places uh, where they can um, um, hide from the atrocities of the war. Um, I will not be taking much time here because we have excellent panelists um, in here. And um, despite my imagination barely catching up with uh, the reality of it all, I do hope 
that we can make some sense out of all of it. Um, uh, we have six excellent panelists. Um, Sergei Greblov is an international student from Ukraine, as Amy mentioned, uh, whose family is from Kiev. He's studying computer science. I would like to give Sergei uh, the floor first. Um, we have Julie Hessler with us. Julie um, is Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon. Uh, she is the author of a social history of Soviet trade, as well as a number of articles on Soviet social, economic, and cultural history. Julie will speak on Putin's view of Ukraine in connection to his broader political perspective and why relations between Russia and Ukraine deteriorated so far in the past 20 years. Jake, uh, Jake Hamblin uh, is a professor of history at Oregon State University and writes about the history and politics of science, technology, and environmental issues. In his most recent book, he focuses on the prom promotion of nuclear solutions, especially in the developing world from 1945 to the present. In the light of Russian, uh, Russian, force, forces, Russian forces seizing Chernobyl and tightening their control over Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Jake will confine his remarks to nuclear issues and touch on weapons uh, and energy. Sarah Henderson. Um, Sarah Henderson is Associate Professor in Political Science at OSU with interest in Russia, Central and Eastern Europe, democratization and civil society. She has written extensively about Russian President Vladimir Putin. Sarah will speak on Putin's potential endgame, thinks he misjudged and why he misjudged them and specific changes he has implemented to make it really hard for Russians to both get real information and express real opinions beyond patriotic ones. Philip Kneis holds a PhD in American studies from a University of Potsdam in Germany. He currently teaches at the School of Public Policy at Oregon State University. His main research interests pertain to intersections of culture and politics in the US and the European Union. Philip will talk about the recent changes to German policy when it comes to energy and defense, and how do those changes play out in their historical context and within EU framework. And last but not least, Chris Nichols uh, is an associate professor uh, in the School of History, Philosophy and Religion at OSU and the director of the OSU Center for the Humanities. As an expert on modern US intellectual, cultural and political history, he explores and analyzes the US relationship to the rest of the world. Chris topics for today is US foreign policy. What can Biden administration do to feasibly facilitate the end of this war? And if not, is the NATO involvement a real option and what would it entail? Um, thank you all for agreeing to uh, be fun to join us today. I'm expecting a wonderful uh, presentations uh, followed up by at least 30 minutes of Q&A. So I hope we can all have uh, a wonderful uh, conversation at the end. Having said that, uh, Sergi, I would like to give you the floor first. I would like to give you the floor first and in acknowledgement of um, your experiences and what you must be going through uh, along with uh, your family back in Ukraine or hopefully now back to safety. Um, so Sergi, can you share um, your perspective on what's happening right now? Hey everyone. Um, so first of all, thanks for having me here. It's really huge support from all Oregon State University community and just international community in general that helps us to go through these hard moments. Um, I'm just happy to inform that my family escaped to a safer place for now, so they're not in the zone of immediate danger. And I'll just try to share my own perspective on these ongoing events. Unfortunately, I'm not a historian and not a psychologist, so I cannot really give a broader thought, a broader analogy, but I'll just try to give you what I survived for and what I can describe. So first of all, uh, many of you sitting here probably are just wondering how do people feel when the war is being declared for them. So, the war is similar to a shock. It strikes a nation and it spreads throughout all people. By the time when first missiles hit Kiev, I'm pretty sure half of the population was already uh, awake and was wondering what to do. Um, after five minutes of uh, the message that Putin recorded on the day of war declaration, 
um, it was spread along all channels that uh, people watch in Ukraine. So pretty much everyone was aware of what's going on. And when the sirens uh, went aloud, everyone was knowing what to do and how to hide in the bomb shelters. After the first shock, you become really motivated. It's not about the fear that you feel, it's just about motivation that you need to do something. You want to save the people you love, you want to help others, and um, you just need to do something in general to not be passive, to not go from motivation to fear. Um, even such people as I, who are not directly involved in the action in Ukraine, try to help as much as we could. We try to gather support, we try to find cars for people who don't have them to escape the cities. Uh, we try to communicate news for people who are not able to get them from the general channels. It's a really hard moment when you feel that you need to do something, you just don't need to abstain of this and avoid any contacts. Second thing that came to us was anger. I was pretty much just a regular person and was never seeking war. Also, I thought that it's kind of very stupid to fight war for borders, to fight war for resources. Lives are just much more valuable than anything you can get from government, from your country. But when you're being attacked on, it's not about borders, it's not about resources, it's just a personal matter. When you hear people banging on your door, it's assault on yourself, not on whatever your country possesses. And in probably today's my attitude towards the overall actions just changed radically. My classmates were the same as I, 19 years old, just voluntarily go to army even to the army of the government they never agreed to, they never voted for Zelensky as a president. They just decided that it's not a time for any political discussions, not a time to decide what is better for the country. It's just a time to do something, to fight, to help them in many other ways. Um, the anger united people, but at the same time, it moved us to a really extreme level. Um, First day, I reached out to almost everyone I knew. I tried to find that they're still alive, that uh, they are trying to do whatever they can to evacuate from the danger zones. And every day after the first day, I was seeing a lot of photos of dead people, of death, of destruction, of murder. By some time, it just became something normal to me, the same as for many other people in Ukraine. Um, you just open the news, open your contacts and see that, oh yeah, missile got into your friend's house, someone got killed, someone you knew, and it just stopped being something special. It's just that something you see every day. And by this time, um, it really, I'm really afraid of the fact that I'm not more worried when I open the Reddit or open the social media and find out that some people died in this action. It just became normal to us because it happens every day and our psychology is able to adapt to everything and especially is able to adapt to such horrible events. So by the time you're, you just stop being the human you was before, you become something that can go through these events without just lying on the bed and crying. Um, another part is the, all the emotional stuff. Um, many Ukrainians who are now are not just like sad all the moment, all the time because of the ongoing events. You can go from crying to being happy and enthusiastic in like 30 minutes and then back to your crying in the bed. It really depends on what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and it feels like your organ is just trying to figure out what to do, how to avoid just feeling in the despair and uh, tries to find the balance between all these states. Finally, um, I want to say that Although Putin, with his war, put an extreme danger to existence of Ukrainians as a nation, at the same time, he united us as he never did before. Uh, we didn't unite around our political leaders. A huge portion of people never agreed with the actions of our president, both Lansky and previous president, uh, Petro Poroshenko. But when the war came, we just became a nation that we never been before. When Putin said that he's never re recognized Ukrainians as uh, the nation, there is some truth that he actually created us as a really powerful force that can resist him. If he did the same thing in 2014 when he firstly invaded Ukraine and took the Donbass region, probably his initial plan of taking the whole Ukraine in a couple of days would succeed because Ukraine was never so, uh, so gathered together by this idea of resistance, by this idea of our nationality. And 
just to conclude, I'm thankful to everyone who came here, who support Ukrainians around the world and who just pays attention to this ongoing matter. It's truly important to remember that any war is just a horrible act of action, no matter where it happened, in Ukraine, in Syria, or in um, any other country. But the fact that people can adapt everything and the fact that we are getting used to killing others is just something that makes me especially horrible about these events. Thanks for having me here. Sergi, um, thank you for your uh, absolutely honest and vulnerable uh, testimony right now. Uh, you mentioned so many emotions that um, uh, surprise, anger, fear, um, despair in a sense, but also trying to find balance. I am full of admiration uh, to uh, Ukrainians um, and uh, hope for uh, the even stronger uh, outcome uh, from the unity of, of you all. Um, and uh, I appreciate um, you speaking so uh, courageously about how you feel at this moment. I hope your family is safe. I hope your friends and, and family are safe. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, we as concerned uh, faculty at uh, School of History, Philosophy and, Philo uh, and Religion will try to do our best to support you and your fellow students um, throughout this process. Uh, having said that, I would like to pass the floor to Julie Hessler. Um, Julie, your commentary, please. Yes, hello. I'm trying to get a screen share. I've brought in a few slides. Um, uh, let's see. I should have tested this beforehand. It's a different... I just want to share... Um, um, just one second. The screen share didn't quite work. Um, one more time. Yeah, let me try again. Your co-host now. Okay. Um, does it work now? Do you see a Do you see a slideshow? No. No. Okay, we'll skip this. We'll we'll skip the slideshow. Um. So, I, I sort of thought I'd talk about this war as Putin's war. Um, and I, I guess before that, I'm feeling very emotional having just heard Sergi's remarks. Um, this has all been really heartbreaking for me um, I, in trying to think about how Putin understands the situation. I certainly don't want to give the impression that I condone it in his actions or the Russian government's actions in any way. Um, I wanted to call it Putin's war just because I, I, I wanted to underscore for Americans the fact that it's not as though Russians had a choice in the matter. They didn't vote for this war. Um, though I have to say that the first public opinion results are starting to trickle in. Um, and at the moment, it looks as though many Russians do support the war, either fully or somewhat. Um, that's less true in the big cities, and it's less true among young people, which at least gives me certain cause for hope. Um, and of course, it's a result of Putin's um, authoritarian regime and the controlled media that I think Sarah is going to give us some more information about. Um, what I, I thought I would start with just his view of Ukraine in general, because this, again, it has some explanatory value. Um, he's talked about Ukraine and Russia as one nation, uh, nations, uh, one nation because of their shared culture, shared history, um, the fact that many, he says, shared religion, but that's certainly not true of all Ukrainians, um, but still that many Ukrainians are uh, Orthodox Christians. Um, he sees their languages as coming, stemming from the same East Slavic root, um, which is accurate. Many Russians have family in Ukraine. Many Ukrainians have family in Russia. It's, um, there, there is a lot of shared history and culture between these two nations. Um, but again, he sees them as one nation. Um, he's inclined to think of that 
um, unity as the result not of a kind of colonial relationship between Russia and Ukraine or the subjugation of Ukraine, but rather he, like his Soviet predecessors, um, is inclined to think of it in terms of a voluntary union um, dating back to the 17th century um, and continuing through uh, 19, up until 1991. Um, so his view of matters based on his declaration of war, the speech he gave in, in which he declared war, was that um, the Soviet Union artificially um, strengthened a separate Ukrainian identity by creating rep a, a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, which obviously there's a lot to discuss or dispute about that portrayal of Ukrainian history. Putin also thinks about Ukraine from a different perspective. He thinks about Ukraine as a kind of failed state. And here, I think it's important to look at the differences in the development of Russia and Ukraine since independence in 1991. Um, Ukraine and Russia both experienced economic turmoil in the, and decline in the first part of the 1990s. Um, in the case of Ukraine, that continued for a much longer time and it went deeper. Um, Ukraine was used to being thought of as the second of the Soviet republics in terms of its economy um, after Russia itself. Um, and if that wasn't quite true in 1991, Kazakhstan had overtaken it. Um, it was still one of the wealthier republics. Um, today, Ukraine, um, again, it's gone through a long period of economic turmoil and problems. Um, it is or was right before the pandemic. Um, Europe's poorest nation in terms of GDP per capita. So Putin's narrative about Ukraine is that this is a fail, this is the product of a failed state, a failed state that has failed to create economic prosperity um, and that moreover has suffered from corruption, not to say that Russia hasn't, um, and moreover that has experienced political turbulence in the form of two revolutions, one in 2004 and one in 2014. And both of those are complex events. They both resulted from protests in Kiev centered on the Maidan Nizalezhnosti or Independence Square, Central Square in Kiev with hundreds of thousands of protesters. And they involved Ukraine's pivotal position between Russia and European or Western institutions. Um, um, in each case, they resulted in um, an, over, an overturning some electoral results. Now, in the case of 2004, the elections were really uh, fraudulent. Um, not so true of the 2010 elections. Um, but overturning those electoral results and reorienting Ukraine more in a European direction and less in a Russian direction. Um, so uh, Putin responds to, the, to those events in a couple of ways. You know, one, again, they're just a sign of Ukraine's instability. Um, the instability that comes from a weak state. Uh, Russia, by contrast, has seen its economy grow to far greater heights than the Ukrainian economy, and that growth coincided with Putin's um, first election in 2000 and the stability and strengthening of the Russian state afterwards. So there's a, st a strong state narrative. There's also a narrative about... Um, uh, meddling by foreign powers. Uh, so Putin's view of the 2004 and 2014 revolutions, the revolution, the Orange Revolution and the so-called Revolution of Dignity, um, is that those were not exactly um, Europe, uh, Ukrainians uh, showing their own agency and making their own choices for their future, but rather that these resulted from meddling by foreign powers that were implacably hostile to Russia and above all, the United States and its Western European allies. Um, these revolutions did incontestably result in um, harming Russia's economic and geopolitical interest. But you know, Russia's narrative is that they weren't a Ukrainian choice. They were an illegitimate coup that was um, kind of manipulated by foreign meddling from the West. So those events led to a cycle, a really vicious cycle. Um, it's something that in security studies is sometimes called a strategic dilemma, where one side takes actions that it perceives as defensive, but the other side uh, perceives those as offensive or aggressive, 
and uh, ratchets it up. Um, Russia's retaliation to the, um, what it saw as the harming of its interests in Ukraine um, was to uh, annex Crimea and to foment war in the Donbass, uh, the two separatist so-called republics of the Luhansk and Donetsk uh, republics. So um, it did so, Russia, I should say, was not alone. It did so not without any, you know, there, there were people on the ground in both areas who were frustrated by the revolutions of 2004 and especially 2014. So he drew on the um, frustrated sentiment of more Russian-identified uh, people who lived in those areas. But at the same time, he exacerbated the situation by putting in military, by kind of militarizing it um, through um, the provisionment of weapons, but also through people on the ground, um, Russian military forces on the ground. So that's the Russia, uh, the Russia's retaliation in this vicious cycle. And the Donbass, of course, has been a war zone ever since, with 14,000 lives lost even before the current war in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's retaliation um, was more, and it's, again, it, I don't want to in any way make it sound as though Ukraine's actions were at all equivalent to the Russian aggression. Um, but Ukraine's actions, not surprisingly, Ukraine took the Russian interventions in Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, this is, you know, the Donbass. Not surprisingly, um, Ukrainians did not react well to this, and the Ukrainian government responded by turning more than it had in the past, more decisively, towards NATO and um, European institutions. So Ukraine has added to its constitution an amendment that indicates its intention of joining NATO. Um, it also uh, somewhat reduced Russian language rights um, within Ukraine. So again, this is a very complex situation with a vicious cycle happening. Uh, I, Putin's actions suggest some things about what he wants. Um, I'm almost out of time, so and I think Sarah's going to talk more about some of these issues. Um, what he wants at the minimum is to obtain international recognition for the annexation of Crimea and for the Donbass. But it's pretty clear that that's not all he wants, because if he wanted that, he could have gotten it probably with a lot lower cost, with something far short of an all-out invasion of Ukraine from all directions, um, bombing Kharkov and Kiev and taking Kherson. Um, it seems pretty clear that what he ultimately wants is to restore Russia to what he describes um, as the Russian world, a phrase he constantly uses. Um, and also, he hopes to demonstrate to the world Russia's strength, um, to make the point that Russia is a strong country, the kind of strong country that doesn't face consequences when it invades another country, um, just as he sees like America's invasion of Iraq as not facing consequences. Now, it didn't always come out the, the best way for, uh, for anybody, but he, this is the kind of parallel he wants. And I think ultimately his aim is to um, revise the international order uh, with recognition of Russia's strength and um, in a way that takes into account Russia's sphere of inf influence in that so-called Russian world. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Julie, very much. Um, we can't be sure of what uh, Putin wants, uh, but we can certainly be sure that if um, he undermined the unity and the agency of the Ukrainian people, um, he has to deal with the reality in which they are proving um, him wrong at the moment. Um, thank you, Julie. Um, I would like to give the floor to Jake. Um, Jake, um, your wisdom in the light of seizing Chernobyl and Zaporizhia, um, please share it with us. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate the two previous speakies, speakers uh, for that great context, for understanding everything that's going on. I should say <clears throat> that I'm uh, a historian. Uh, I'm not Ukrainian and I don't uh, 
I don't have firsthand knowledge of what's going on. I suppose none of us do. Uh, we're not there. The situation is changing all the time. I'm just going to provide some remarks uh, based on my own read of the situation and my own knowledge of nuclear issues. So um, you know, when the, the invasion first occurred, my uh, reaction was, you know, as, as I'm sure you all feel the same way, outrage and, and despair for Ukrainians, but also trying to look at the larger strategic picture and figure out what is going on. And I was also thinking about nuclear issues. And you know, my I initially thought, well, I wonder what Germany is going to do, uh, because of course uh, Germany has, uh, after the the Fukushima disaster of 2011, uh, said that they were not going to do nuclear energy anymore, and. Uh, uh, began to rely a great deal on relationships with Russia. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, though. I know Philip is here, and he's going to talk about energy issues, especially related to Germany. So that's the last word I will say on that. Where I uh, started thinking beyond that is I got a lot of texts and emails from colleagues who asked me my opinion about why are the Russians uh, attacking uh, Chernobyl. Uh, and of course, um, you know the the easy answer is it's on the way to Kiev and uh, that it's 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 on the on the way there. Um, but of course, uh, it got more complicated after that. Um, that was the first, I think, big nuclear news uh, of the war is this 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 moment in which Chernobyl suddenly is in the news again. And for Westerners who, because of the, a spate of books on the topic and the HBO uh, miniseries about Chernobyl, people are much more aware of it now than maybe they were even five or ten years ago. Um, those of us who grew up uh, during the Cold War know Chernobyl quite well, of course. Um, you know, it, most of us know Chernobyl uh, as uh, as a disaster, but and it was a disaster, uh, but it also is an important kind of cultural marker uh, for not just Ukrainians, uh, but for the, the entire region, Belarusians as well, and, and Russians, of course. Um, one thing that we often forget in terms of Ukrainian national identity is how important Chernobyl was for the downfall of the, of the Soviet Union and for also nationalism on the side on the side of Ukraine. Um, you know, the failure of Moscow to really handle the event well, uh, to inform people about it, to, to act quickly, but also subsequently covering up information about radiation effects. Um, these were all rallying points uh, in the Ukrainian independence uh, movement. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's an important moment of public memory in Ukraine, also in Belarus. Uh, you know, where some people want to focus on the harm from uh, from Chernobyl, and others want to focus on the patriotism of uh, firefighters. And even if you focus, if, if you, even if you acknowledge that it was a disaster, uh, you want to focus on the uh, the patriotism of firefighters or people who are trying to put out the um, trying to end uh, the Chernobyl. Uh, problem. So that's, there's already a political discussion uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere about the meaning of a of a disaster like Chernobyl. What does it mean? Is it is it something that we can all kind of uh, get behind uh, as a nation uh, as something to drive out this sort of outsider? And if, if that's the narrative, then uh, then then Moscow, Russia, is an an outsider in that. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that Chernobyl has a lot more meaning than just, hey, there's a nuclear disaster and that it's not just about nuclear power. Uh, it also has a great deal of, of cultural and political implications about relationships with Russia uh, and, and independence in general. Um, and the irony, of course, is that after independence, um, Ukraine was stuck with Chernobyl. Uh, and you know, I had to figure out how to finance uh, all of the the, the cleanup and uh, trying to give um, uh, um, payments to to people who were uh, victims of Chernobyl themselves, uh, because now they were an independent country, which definitely made things even more complicated. Uh, but another great irony of it, of course, is that that Ukraine Ukraine did in fact embrace nuclear energy. Uh, because of, for a lot of complicated reasons uh, that I'm sure other panelists could tell me more about. Uh, but uh, one of the upsides of that is Ukraine did turn even more to Russia after that because the, the fuel for its nuclear reactors uh, was supplied by Russia. Uh, so it's a very complicated relationship that, that where the, the nuclear side of it, um, it has, it has cultural importance, it has economic uh, importance. Um, but it also has to do with, you know, there are some in Ukraine who see nuclear energy 
as very much a part of the conversation about uh, sovereignty uh, and being an independent country, you have to be able to power yourself. Um, but but is it really uh, independent? Uh, because of course you have to rely on outsiders uh, for fuel and, and things of that nature. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of politics, especially after um, uh, 2014, the Crimea situation. Uh, a lot of the politics of nuclear politics of Ukraine has been about diversifying fuel supplies, trying to get other countries to, to give them uh, uh, fuel for their nuclear reactors. And this is very much on the minds uh, of politicians in Russia as well, because that is a kind of leverage that uh, Russians have over Ukraine. Um, you know, Ukraine relies on nuclear energy for about half of its, uh, of its electricity needs. So if you can take control of those nuclear reactors, uh, that's an important, uh, it's an important economic aim. And I'm unfortunately, we're seeing now it's an important war aim uh, from the point of view of, of Russia. And when we see uh, attacks on these big nuclear facilities, there are about four, there are four big nuclear facilities in Ukraine. And the largest one, I'm sure you saw the headline, uh, was attacked and there was a fire and people were concerned. When you look at the news headlines, you will often see concerns regarding nuclear things as either threat of nuclear war or maybe nuclear contamination, a radioactive contamination. Those are all valid concerns. I'm not trying to play those down, um, but they may be more direct concerns, like uh, being able to exert a, a great deal of leverage over another country by taking control of their ability to power themselves. And I don't mean power for just you know charging your phones or whatever, although that's important. Uh, but, you know, the ability to heat your home, the ability to do any number of things, uh, it's a great deal of leverage to be able to do that. So uh, when we think about nuclear issues, it's not just weapons, it's not just radioactive harm, it also is, is energy. Um, the two things that I really wanted to talk about, and just to try to stay on time, is number one, nuclear reactors and the things that have been in the news. But of course, the other things that have been in the news are, are the weapons themselves. Uh, nuclear weapons are, a, you know, a very... Con Ukraine has this, this very complicated relationship with nuclear weapons. I guess a question that I would pose to the, the audience and, and, and whoever else uh, is, you know, what, what is this war going to mean for the, for the nuclear uh, order, as uh, poly, uh, political science people like to call it? Uh, because the United States, Great Britain, Russia, other countries have for decades uh, really depended on this non-proliferation treaty and the, no the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons being kind of the cornerstone of their international relations with the rest of the world, trying to prevent other countries from having nuclear weapons. Um, the situation in Ukraine really challenges that in some pretty dramatic ways. Uh, in you know, af after the fall of the of the USSR, Ukraine ended up with about a, 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 the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world because a lot of the nuclear weapons were in Ukraine. Uh, when the USSR collapsed uh, and you, the Ukraine voluntarily uh, gave up those nuclear weapons in what was known as the Budapest Memorandum with the United States, Russia, uh, Great Britain, uh, saying that these countries would um, provide assurances of, of sovereignty of, 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 and respect the borders of Ukraine and wouldn't tolerate anybody invading Ukraine uh, in, in return for the Ukrainians giving up those nuclear weapons. Uh, so Ukraine gave them up, uh, and uh, you know, and we are now where we are, and it's really hard to also uh, it's hard to overstate this, but uh, the reason there isn't an even stronger than economic sanction response to Russia is because Russia has nuclear weapons. Um, so trying to imagine. Um, what we are going to be able to do moving forward in terms of trying to reduce our, our reliance on nuclear weapons, uh, it's, it's going to be it's going to be tough. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, of course, but uh, it's that's kind of the gloomy part of it. I mean, yes, the threat of nuclear war right now is, is a gloomy thing that people like to ask me about. Uh, but I also just think about um, um, you know, how much this war has undermined uh, the, the, our, our, our efforts to try to get people to step away from nuclear weapons. Um, so it does seem like nuclear weapons are a deterrent. Um, assurance of sovereignty have not been maintained clearly. Um, and I suspect that we will end up seeing more nuclear states in the future. Um, anyway, with that gloomy uh, note, I, I, I think I'll stop. I have other comments. You know, Some people ask me about nuclear war. I don't think um, there's no good outcome for Russia in nu using nuclear weapons. Uh, I think there's a lot of 
um, jingoism and scare tactics going on in the media right now about the threat of nuclear war. Um, I don't I don't want to go so far as to call that irresponsible, but um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Jake. Um, not to undermine the power of our imaginations. Um, I would rather not imagine that because I, uh, you know, I am afraid that we might have to leave it uh, uncertain, uh, unfortunately, at one point. Um, the reality crawls into uh, our imaginations uh, very quickly. Um, you left on a gloomy note. Uh, you know, there's nothing really uplifting about this whole thing. So thank you for, uh, for um, your presentation. Um, and for, for being here with us, Jake. Uh, questions will follow, I'm sure. Um, with that said, I would like to uh, invite Sarah Henderson um, to speak perhaps on what is, what is the, the potential end game that Putin wants to um, achieve. Sarah? Thank you, Marta, and thank everyone for coming um, to try to work together as a group to, to try to understand what's going on. And I, I want to talk about three um, big issues. What are Putin's aims and in-game Russian capabilities or, or lack thereof to achieve Putin's goals? And, and some thoughts on whether sanctions can indirectly put pressure on Putin to change course given the vertical power structure that um, he has established from 2000 to 2022 in Russia. Um, so let's tackle that, that first question, what does Putin want? Um, I think Julie gave um, a very good answer to that, um, that I, I don't think this is a restoration of the USSR borders, but, but more for Russia to be seen and treated as a great power with a recognized sphere of influence. Um, accompanying this, I think, is a, a real deep-seated resentment and Putin-esque narrative that the West and the US in particular deeply disrespects the Russian point of view and is actively seeking to undermine Russia's position um, in the world. I think this is the Putin narrative. Um, and I think this is a view that he did not necessarily hold initially, but was debuted in the 2007 at the Munich Security Conference and has, has really deepened in the years since then. And the reason why I'm spending time on this point um, is because I think to political scientists, they would, it's, they would say that this goal of Putin's to obtain a sphere of influence is, is a core national security issue for him. And therefore, um, Putin will be willing to escalate substantially to achieve this core national security goal. And I think one significant problem right now is that while there is discussion of a need for diplomatic off ramps, that is some kind of diplomatic concessions um, in order to deescalate, there is no overlap right now between the West and our Ukraine and, and Russia. So Dmitry Peskov, um, Putin's spokesperson uh, yesterday, or maybe it was Monday, indicated that it's still going to demand recognition of the annexation of Crimea, the two breakaway republics, constitutional neutrality for Ukraine, and essentially a, a demilitarized Ukraine. Uh, these are not concessions right now that I can imagine either Ukraine, um, or Ukrainian leadership or Western powers will accede to. But ideas that I've also heard floated earlier in terms of Western prompted concessions, such as um, more arms talks, uh, an increased role for Russia on a NATO, NATO council, also aren't going to be sufficient for Russia. Um, so I think one thing we're going to need to be prepared for is the fact that while sanctions are going to inflict a high cost um, they are not necessarily going to deter Russia as sanctions have difficulty deterring countries on, on matters of core national security. That's not to say that sanctions aren't worthwhile, um, but it will be a long haul. And this is something we really need to be aware of, given that the U.S. as a democracy is facing midterm elections and presidential elections soon something which I think the Kremlin is also aware of and will be wanting to exploit to the fullest. And so um, governments in the West need to be preparing after these initial few weeks about why maintaining sanctions are important despite what is going to be um, higher costs. 
I think a second key issue is that even though this is a core national security issue as defined by the Putin administration, as most of you have read, things have not gone according to plan, um, according to Putin's plan. Um, I don't know if anyone read about the RIA, RIA Novosti, which is the state Russian news service mistakenly publishing an editorial a day or two days after the invasion, um, which they subsequently had to remove very quickly because it praised the dawn of a new era in which Russian unity is restored, um, linking together Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. It also referred to reversing Russia's humiliation and returning Russia to the world stage, while the West will disintegrate as a result of the rift between what they call the Anglo-Saxons and the Europeans, um, who they argue were not interested in establishing a new iron curtain on their borders and the editorial ends by praising a new multipolar world, Russia's return to its historical space and place in the world, which will no longer be run on the West terms nor its rules. Um, now, this did not come to pass in the initial 48 hours. Um, rather, the list of things that Putin badly misjudged is quite lengthy. Um, Ukrainian solidarity, um, Zelensky's response, Western unity, the ability of the United States under the Biden administration to help organize a concerted response, um, the muted response of other key global players such as India and China that Russia was perhaps counting on, and finally the performance of the Russian military forces themselves, which as we've all seen, although inexorably advancing, certainly are doing so much more slowly and less competently than many would expect given the resources that Putin has invested in um, the military and also in terms of the number of troops that he has put on the ground. And so we've seen all the speculation. Is Putin mentally ill? Have the two years of near isolation from COVID affected him? And I can't speculate, you know, none of us, well, we can all speculate, but we don't know what goes on in his head. But a political scientist might point out that to some extent, this horrific misjudgment is the consequence of being in power either as president or prime minister since 1999. Um, so we're looking at over 22 years that in that space, Russia has moved from a hybrid regime or a flawed democracy under the Yeltsin era to what's called a personalized autocracy which basically means an autocratic form of government in which power really tends to revolve around the personality as a person, as, a, as opposed to, say, the military or a party um, or, say, a hereditary monarch. Um, and so part of this misjudgment is a reflection of since 2000 in stages, Putin's efforts to restore the power vertical in politics has also emasculated all checks on presidential power in Russia through various laws. He now has a quiescent legislature, an obedient ruling party, new constitutional reforms enable him to potentially run for two more terms in office, extending his rule for 12 years. And I think the larger point is certain elements in the US have betrayed Putin as a brilliant strategist, but more broadly, I think what this shows is that democracy matters, that the slow erosion of checks, which often force leaders to have to view unpleasant truths, is a partial explanation of how Putin was so misinformed. Um, so who is he relying on then? Um, instead, he's supported by a relatively small elite, which the Western media has termed the oligarchs, but which I think is not quite accurate. It's more a small group of loyalists, most of whom are actually not the oligarchs, but are allies from earlier years, um, from St. Petersburg and also from the security services. Many of these who he has subsequently made wealthy um, through appointment at the helm of various state-owned companies. But the larger point is simply that he's created a system in which whatever perks or privileges accrue to those people rest on him staying in power one way or another. And this bleeds into the final point I want to make, which is uh, that Putin has constructed a system in which he's really insulated from pressure points in part because he spent the past 10 years making it increasingly difficult for citizens to mobilize in the previous 20, reestablishing control over a Kremlin-friendly media. With regard to civil society, since an initial outbreak of protests in 2011 and 2012, here's just a few things he's done. He's actually, by 2019, 
uh, through the Duma had passed 35 different laws limiting citizen activism. Um, he's focused on legally roping off a good patriotic civil society from kind of a bad unpatriotic civil society. The things that make you unpatriotic are associating with or receiving funding from the West, um, exhibiting extremist ideas, um, uh, allowing the government um, or allowing the government to declare certain organizations as undesirable. Um, and these are groups that can represent to the Russian government definition of a threat to public order or inviting social discord. Um, there are a number of laws increasing costs to protesters who are caught at unauthorized um, protests. And this includes single person pickets. Um, also, the state has an enormous ability to block access to the internet, particular sites, seize internet data, and ban information. So I think the broader picture is that seeing any citizen on the streets right now in Russia protesting, I think, is significant and not without significant risks, as protesters risk losing their jobs, going to jail, or getting beat up by an increasingly militarized police. All this together adds up to a situation, and I think the most horrific, horrible, likely scenario, which I hope is not true, but which I fear is a long, grim war in Ukraine waged by a regime willing to use increasingly brutal tactics to win a Russian regime that is pretty insulated and a West that is going to need to stay pretty united. But I think the stakes are high and echoing um, earlier comments, I think we're discussing really the durability of the post-World War II order, which I think has provided more safety and economic stability than the hundred years that preceded it, and certainly is not an era that we want to return to. Thanks, Marta. Thank you, Sarah. Um, very in-depth um, analysis of his Putin's potential uh, end goal and whether he will achieve it or not, we do not know, but we do know that he's very effective in silencing his own people. As of today, 13,000 uh, protesters have been um, arrested, uh, anti-war protesters have been arrested um, since the war started two weeks ago. Um, thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, I would like to uh, pass the this virtual floor now to Philip. Um, Philip, your insight on uh, Germany uh, in the context of European Union um, will be very much welcomed at this moment. Thank you very much. Um, let me start though first with a map that was shown on Russian state television, and I saw this um, also on German television. So this um, is a map that shows um, the formation of the borders of Ukraine. And it shows several things that were Podolki gifts, either of the Russian Tsar, according to Putin, that's the big orange area in the, on the top, or Podarki Lenina, the gifts by Lenin, that's the Donbass region, um, the gift Podarok by Khrushchev, that's Crimea, um, or the gifts um, by Stalin uh, on the left. Now, when we look at such a map that illustrates not just what's allegedly in Putin's mind, but it also goes back to a long line of history in which the area that, um, that is Ukraine has undergone many territorial changes and has been at the receiving end of imperial aggression. Now, so the Russian empire has been expanding into both Asian and European territories. Um, but the area that, that we are speaking about when we talk about Ukraine has been typically at the borderlines between German and Russian and Austrian imperial claims. Now this, um, this shows um, how there has been a sinister game being played between Germany and Russia, Russia for centuries, and how this plays also into the narrative by Putin that there is no European, uh, that there is no Ukrainian statehood. Of course, we know that statehood and nationhood um, are not the same, and there are plenty of nations um, or people that don't have a state. So in that sense, just because Ukraine 
isn't on this map doesn't mean that Ukrainians don't exist, that Ukrainian culture and language don't exist. We see after World War I, um, again, a pact between Germany and Russia in the Hitler-Stalin pact. People typically know that Germany attacked Poland. It's typically not focused on that two weeks later, the Soviet Union attacked Poland as well. And then took the Baltic states, uh, took Bessarabia, which is now Moldova, and also parts of Finland. The fact that later Nazi Germany attacked Russia or the Soviet Union does not take away from the Soviet imperial designs on these territories either. So you have Ukraine being at the receiving end of Soviet aggression and then of German aggression which means that those fighting for Ukrainian independence sometimes even sided with uh, Nazi Germany, especially after the Holodomor when Stalin imposed the forced, um, forced hunger on the Ukrainian people. But um, then the Nazis conquered Ukraine too because they were, um, that was on, uh, on, the line, uh, on the road also to the Caucasus. Also, um, Ukraine has always been in the focus of um, German colonization. During Soviet times, Ukraine, of course, was a socialist um, Soviet Republic, um, like Belarus and the Baltic um, states of Moldova also. And we are all familiar with um, the idea of the Iron Curtain. I grew up in East Germany, so I'm very well aware that whenever you see protesters standing on the street right now, multiply each person that you see in, that you see on the street, maybe with a thousand, maybe with a million. It is really, really courageous to protest in Russia against this war. Even in the United States, it will not be easy to protest as a Russian against this war because you will probably have relatives in Russia. You will have relatives in Ukraine, maybe in both countries. So we should not see this as a war. And I would like to echo what others have said before. This is not necessarily a Russian war. This is Putin's war. And whatever we hear about public opinion in Russia is probably not necessarily true or not necessarily verifiable. Putin claims, and I would really seriously doubt that this is what he really says, it's a strategy that NATO aggressively expanded against what was agreed upon uh, after German unification. Any agreement that was reached well, um, in, in, in writing, every single agreement says that there's no limit on NATO expansion. All these countries that have been freed from Soviet rule are independent and can choose their own history. There's a narrative though, in Germany especially, that somehow Germany promised that NATO didn't expand. Some of these promises were made by some politicians, but never in writing. And when it comes to the treaties, Russia has always supported NATO expansion and even EU expansion. So this is a false uh, red herring that Putin is throwing out here. When we look at what's happened in Ukraine recently, it's the result of a long game that to the disappointment and shock of many has become only apparent really now. Some people have warned about this, especially in Eastern uh, and Central Europe but these warnings oftentimes were not listened to. You see some of the gas pipelines going through Ukraine and you see some newer pipelines, uh, North Stream 1 and North Stream 2 in the Baltic Sea. You see Turk Stream and Blue Stream going through the um, Black Sea. Especially North Stream has been a project of the German government in the past. And so, we should ask, why is Germany doing this? Why, why is there some kind of political tendency between, between, um, of this happy cooperation between Germany and Russia? Uh, Ambassador Mielnik, the 
Ukrainian ambassador to Germany is very frustrated because he again um, in a newspaper expressed that when he talked to Chancellor Scholz just today, he got the cold treatment. Yeah, so we, we don't quite know um, of, um, why that is other than to look at the main philosophy that Germany has had both towards the Soviet Union and Russia, namely that of change through rapprochement, or you could um, reframe this as change through trade. It has been German policy since the social liberal coalition under Chancellor Brandt to work together with Russia or with the Soviet Union and through this trade, through cultural relations, achieve democracy, achieve peace, achieve some way of tying the nations together positively. This has also come as part of the realization of the immense German guilt um, during the, um, because of the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, what is oftentimes not understood in Germany, that a lot of that death, a lot of that destruction actually happened to Ukraine. When people talk about what happened during World War II, Ukrainian suffering is underplayed. It's typically ignored. So you've had a strange alliance of business, of extremists on the left, extremists on the right, some social democrats, especially under the Schroeder government, to push for these pipelines and to irretrievably almost, as it seems now, tie Germany into the Russian sphere of influence. Chancellor Schroeder set up um, these pipelines. And then after he was not voted into office again, became a board member of Rosneft, uh, later also Gazprom, and he, he still won't say anything against Putin. He is not being able to use his influence against Putin. He once calls Putin a crystal clear Democrat, a saying that haunted German politics for years. However, these policies were also continued under the Merkel government, and they were continued um, till just two weeks ago because Germany has also, for the purpose of fighting against climate change, been heavily disinvesting itself from coal because of Fukushima and the apparent danger of a tsunami hitting Germany. Um, the Merkel government went out of nuclear and now Germany really is in a pickle. Wind and solar are not enough to fulfill Germany's energy needs. They may fulfill 50% of power, but not heating. So if Germany were to say now, we are even ending Nord Stream 1, or we are even stopping the reliance on Russian oil, it would put German industry and German consumers into a complete dependency. And so you've seen also that as a result of German disarmament and German anti-American and pacifist attitudes after the Cold War, that Germany is not even able to deliver any real military equipment um, to Ukraine at this point. Uh, so you've seen a shift starting two weeks ago that Germany actually has promised to finally fulfill or even over fulfill NATO goals to commit a billion euros as a special treasury um, to um, restoring the army. But these are all long-term projects. There are already voices in Germany to say, well, can't we use this money for something else? And Germany is one of the main stumbling blocks to, to really avoid the establishment of a no-fly zone or even of arms deliveries to Ukraine. Now, I don't know about the wisdom of a no-fly zone either, but um, Ukrainian representatives constantly remind Germany that there's too much German angst with regards to Russia, which may be because of the German defeat at Stalingrad and the occupation of half of Germany under the Soviets. But to conclude my portion here, German policy has been, I can only say two-faced, unreliable with regards to Ukraine and Poland, and whatever energy Germany has spent um, during European integration towards France and Western integration 
it has not spent the same amount towards integrating Eastern Europe um, fully into the EU, seeing them as equal players other than expanding German business. And so we see the, the cynical result of this reliance on Russia, of this prioritizing of the, the prioritizing of the Russian prospectus over many years here. Thank you, Philip, uh, very much. Uh, we both uh, grew up under Soviet rule. Um, history is not a stranger to us and being entangled in the historical um, mysteries uh, and politics. Um, hearing your speech, I actually, for the first time in a long time, had the reflection going back, that which brings me back to, um, to all the times in Poland being always strangled in between Germany and Russia and never, end, and never ending. Uh, too well for a pause. Um, but to your point about Ukraine, uh, you know, earlier, um, to sort of give a, um, you know, Poland was uh, not on the map of Europe for 123 years, uh, just because we were not on the map of Europe. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that we did not maintain our identity, right? So hopefully there is some hope uh, in that for Ukrainians as well. Uh, Philip, thank you so much for your insightful um, talk and uh last but not least as i said earlier uh chris nichols um can you please take the floor uh chris um sure. and after that we will we will um, um ask some questions from the audience great i'm happy to thanks so much i'll see if i can't uh conclude things um maybe on a less pessimistic note i'm not sure so um i'll try to do three things focus on my areas of expertise in u.s foreign policy international relations history First, I think um, it's incumbent on us. Uh, one topic that has not been raised a lot here, which is actually quite gratifying, is the tremendously American-centric lens through which so much of US media and even to some extent Western media has, has deployed to cover this. Um, now, you know, not to mention all the mudslinging in American politics about uh, you know, who's to blame or under whose presidency this would or wouldn't have happened. Uh, I think the reality here is that the US's role in this conflict from causes to consequences to solutions is likely to be relatively modest in the long run um, and has not been fundamentally causal. And that brings me to a second point, it's sort of keeping history in view um, <clears throat> on NATO. Uh, and I think this is one kind of mea culpa that a lot of us probably shared. Um, you know, uh, at one point, many seem to rightly conjecture that the Clinton era endorsement of the enlargement of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, as it occurred in the late 1990s, uh, something that Clinton in 1997 saw as heralding a future of democratic peace uh, and democratic enlargement in the West. Um, which has become an enormous issue for Putin, which he's used kind of as a, a cudgel to bludgeon the US, the EU, NATO, a host of other nations and neighbors, uh, arguing that it represents a clear threat um, to uh, to Russia, uh, that it that it um, rejects the, the need for a sphere of influence or buffer zones, as several of the previous panelists have noted. Um, the reality is that, that this invasion has revealed, I think, um, that uh, NATO did not factor significantly here. Uh, the as, as Jake implied, <clears throat> Russia's security um, as uh, determined by its nuclear arsenal uh, is fairly complete uh, in terms of the possibility of counterattack, um, even from a large block of nations. Uh, so NATO is restricted not so much to its military options, but to its economic options and its direct threats to, the, to Russia, in fact, now are, are only becoming clear in terms of economic sanctions policies, which really aren't a function of NATO uh, policies, but NATO countries and their alliance system. Um, so to put it another way, you know, if, you, if you take Putin's own words and sentiments for this, Russia's actions here are about a, a, a sort of false er effort to denazify and disarm Ukraine. They have very little to do fundamentally with the role of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I think that's important to get out there. Um, so third, another bit on the US, uh, it's worth being really blunt. Uh, we haven't hit, hit on this yet. There's a sharp contrast in rhetoric and policy at the top between the last two presidential administrations uh, related to Ukraine, related to NATO, related to the European security, and related to Russia. Right. Donald Trump openly questioned the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. He openly questioned the utility of, of American aid and support for European security. Uh, and he, though he often said no one had been tougher on Russia than he had, there's a long list of things that he attempted to do and did do um, that moderated Obama-era sanctions uh, and, and fundamentally um, uh, it, it, 
it supported uh, Russian authoritarianism. And we could talk about this and, and the Russia specialists here, Ukraine specialists can, can get into that if they'd like. Uh, but the point, one point um, is, you know, very clear that uh, Donald Trump was impeached in late 2019 and early 2020, literally for abuse of power as one of the charges uh, for the infamous phone call in which he holds up hundreds of millions of dollars of security aid to Ukraine in seeking political investigations or announcements thereof to Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. If that signaled nothing else in international relations theory to countries like Russia, it was the US was not very uh, invested in the security of Ukraine, right? That it would uh, toss up uh, and hold up uh, security aid uh, simply for that kind of action uh, is indicative of a deeper um, skepticism about collective security, mutual aid, uh, particularly in preparation for a possible invasion and the ongoing war and insurgency. Um, so there can be no doubt that part of that puzzle too has been a coalescence of a kind of quasi isolationist, pro-authoritarian, unilateralist, anti-collective security, sometimes vaguely white supremacist block in American politics, uh, sometimes explicitly white supremacist, uh, borrowing on the language that we've heard a few other panelists talk about, Anglo-Saxonism, the West, et cetera, uh, that has for the first time arguably in any meaningful way since 1945 meant there's a block in the US that is pro-Russian authoritarianism. Uh, that has per pursued that in foreign policy and in political rhetoric. It's kind of astonishing if you think about it in historical view. All right, in contrast, the Biden administration um, actually issued an interim national security strategy document. I could go on about this. I don't want to go too far. It's remarkably like uh, Harry Truman in 1947 and the Truman Doctrine, or it might be like Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. That is, it's an articulation of a world of armed camps, a view that in fact, um, the, a view that in fact, uh, we are at a quote inflection point, as as uh, Biden puts it in the introduction to this document, which uh, in which democracies are under threat, and that the U.S. Be will become a world leader. Uh, the catchphrase for this has been "America is back." Uh, though to be fair, many critics have seen weakness, not strength, in a number of these actions, such as the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, and we could go on about that. You could also argue that uh, one element of this uh, that has shown the Biden administration's commitment has been the way in which they declassified uh, information regarding Russian buildup of troops and projected that quite broadly, quite regularly, including leaks to the media in the fall of 2021 and early 2022, uh, even getting some real flack from Republicans about this action. Um, in a way, this then undercut Putin's ability, ability to make a, a sort of false flag operation real because there had been so much information put out there by the US about the buildup of troops that no matter what uh, kind of ginned up rationale uh, Putin and Russia put together, uh, it couldn't uh, generally get through the kind of evidence that had been put forward. Um, the response to invasion has been swift. We can talk about that. Some of that's already been mentioned. We're seeing uh, arguably historic sanctions policies with the US as a major player, but only one among many. And this is an important moment to, to consider. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Philip has to say about this. Is the new role of Germany now pushing forward arguably with the largest military spending that it has, uh, that it has put forward since the end of World War II, signaling something new, an emerging new Europe? Or is it simply a sign of this moment? And will, as several other people, Sarah, and I think Julie might have implied this, uh, is this in fact perhaps just a moment to see whether or not any of these alliance systems can, can hold up for long? This is an immediate uh, short-term action rather than something more long-term. In fact, if you're thinking about how the Biden administration is dealing with this and thinking about energy policy, something that Jake mentioned, right right now at this moment, US diplomats are in Venezuela seeking to get them to break with Russia. Senior American officials are there. Uh, they're pushing uh, for the government of Nicolas Maduro, who's an authoritarian ruler of an oil producing country, that, which has meant no formal diplomatic relations between the two, our two countries uh, since 2019. That's the kind of opportunity for alliance systems and, and new orientations in diplomacy that we're seeing, whether or not they bear fruit, um, is, 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 up, is up to you know, uh, history to judge, we shall see. Uh, finally, I just wanted to plant a couple seeds for the last few minutes and for our audience to think about. One is military policy. We haven't gotten to that much yet, right? Ukrainian defenses have been tenacious and admirable, uh, yet the strategic questions here center on Russia and how and why the vast majority of experts, people I've been in touch with for a long time around the world, appear to have been so terribly wrong about Russian military capabilities. What is going on there? No matter what happens from here on out, the Russian military has fundamentally lost in the eyes of experts, I think. And that's something to keep your eye on. International law is another thing to consider. 
Uh, how will international law and institutions um, that are at stake here deal with this moment? Humanitarian crisis, uh, you know, an in, in invasion of a sovereign country um, for the UN, for the International Criminal Court, and so on. There's a lot here at stake in terms of, uh, of, of the kinds of actions that are going forward. Here, Jake uh, sort of um, pushed us to think about nuclear policy precedents, and I'd be interested to talk more about that. What about the non non-proliferation? You know, this seems like a moment at which proof of having nuclear weapons has absolutely been solidified as something any leader of any nation state would want, uh, regardless of their democratic origins or authoritarianism. It secures your territorial integrity. Stop, full stop, right? Um, security policy precedents. I mean, this is a fascinating moment too for NATO. Um, as some of our history colleagues, uh, Fred Logoval, Arna Westad recently said in a panel they did at Harvard, right? They can't imagine countries like Sweden and Finland in any other context coming together, pluralities or majorities asking to join NATO. And that has just happened. That is dramatically new. I mean, I, you know, I can't, since 1949, in the beginning of NATO, I would not have imagined some of these countries uh, wanting to join individuals within them, not just leaders. And a fascinating element of that that I would pose, it, it's a joke that's going around. Um, so some of our European colleagues, uh, only Putin could bring Switzerland out of its longstanding neutrality, right? So, but what are the, what are the long tail effects of that? Um, another one to just foreground uh, for our conversation for our audience is sanctions, right? Never in human history has such a fully integrated world attempted to isolate and punish one very large, well-armed and powerful nation. Is that even possible? Is that wise? What happens as Julie and Sarah and others were noting as Philip, when you, when you poten potentially box into a corner uh, a nation state through economic sanctions? We've not seen this uh, with, with a major power. Um, you know, and, and so we haven't touched on one other major player here. There's a number of other topics to consider, but what's the role of China? Uh, what are the lessons for other countries in this moment? Um, you know, what's possible in other conflict zones or areas where invasions or incursions might be possible, uh, such as the Korean Peninsula or between India and Pakistan? What are the lessons that world leaders are taking from this and citizens around the world? Um, and speaking of that, speaking of crises, my last point, um, it remains to be seen, but it's deeply worrisome to contemplate what might be the amplifying effects of these crises on the pandemic and vice versa. Right? This is an area of the world with very low vaccination and booster rates. Uh, Omicron came late to this, this part of the world. Uh, and if there's a significant economic downturn and a humanitarian and refugee crisis, you know, what might be the result of that? Um, these are all important open questions for us to consider. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it's always to, to, to listen to your wise voice and, uh, and thoughts. Um, Chris's uh, uh, um, talk concludes our um, speeches by the panelists who agreed to join us. Now we have a little bit of time left for uh, questions from the audience. And we have uh, quite a lot of questions um, uh, and not enough time. Uh, so, um, I would just uh, maybe ask um, for brief, you know, thoughts from um, the panelists. Whoever wants to take this this one on on a couple of uh, questions. Here is one from Andrew. Could the global unity against Putin and sending uh, weapons from NATO countries to Ukraine result in Putin declaring war on more countries? Is it is it a visible is it a feasible um, thing that will may happen? that uh, more countries will face declaration of war? Jake, would you like to handle that maybe? Uh, yes, sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I was reading uh, some of the Todd Parker's uh, question while you were asking that one. That was not what I should have been doing. Uh, so <laughs> the question is about, will more, could you rephrase the question? Yeah, uh, are we to expect, uh, if, if NATO sends weapons, are we to expect Russia declaring war on more countries? Well, another person asked a very similar question and I was answering it in the, in the Q&A. And I think at this point, uh, NATO has tried to send a pretty strong signal that there's a there's a lot there is a a, a line between uh, economic aid and, and economic sanctions and uh, between those economic things and direct military aid and there have even been some ideas among NATO countries that maybe we should be sending uh, you know weapons uh, to Ukraine and uh, trying to communicate that this is not this is not military intervention NATO is trying to communicate that uh, because of course that would widen the conflict considerably. 
the person who asked the question before that I was answering uh, was asking whether or not Russia will invade another country. And of course, this is very hard to predict, but um, we're already seeing things from, from Putin saying, well, this is an economic war, which really broadens his options in terms of response. Uh, but uh, also we should bear in mind um, that it would probably not be a good idea for Russia to invade another country, right? It's not going well in Ukraine. Uh, it's, this is not a limitless amount of resources that Russia has to wage war. Uh, this is, it's not predictable, of course, but I, 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 I don't know if we need to necessarily assume that that will happen. Um, Chris's point about Switzerland is a good one. Uh, you know, only this sort of war can bring Switzerland out of its, uh, I mean, I think Switzerland's still dealing with the shame of harboring Nazis, Nazi wealth uh, during World War II. And so they don't want to be put in that position again. But um, the, uh, there are a lot of countries right now who are on the border of Russia who are wondering, are, you know, we also were part of the USSR. Uh, maybe this is our future as well. And being part of NATO is what shields us from that. Um, Finland is suddenly interested in, in, in talking about, uh, you know, some options uh, moving forward. So um, that's, that's a non-answer to the question, but uh, acknowledging that it's an interesting one. I've got a word or two to say about that. And that's, that's just that um, I, I do think that Ukraine has a special emotional resonance for Russians. Um, that only Belarus matches. Um, and Belarus is quite frankly already functionally subordinate to Russia. Um, so uh, the, the places where I feel like the, or where I think I should say, um, that are undoubtedly the most at risk are Georgia, which has already, like Ukraine, had border con a border conflict started by Russia um, uh, over um, an ethnic minority that wasn't happy, you know, two uh, ethnic minorities that weren't happy um, with Georgia, um, but Russia has, you know, fomented war between those those um, ethnic areas and the Republic of Georgia. The Georgians are undoubtedly really nervous right now. Um, I don't think that they're, that Putin's going to go there for the very reason that Jake said, which is that it doesn't and they're already clearly overextended militarily and not very successful. But I can see why the Georgians in particular would be very nervous. And I think that the same goes for the three Baltic countries, which are NATO members. I think it would be very unlikely that Putin would attack them because that would necessarily widen the conflict um, without a clear, an obvious gain um, or exit uh, strategy, um, but I can imagine that they are also feeling very nervous right now. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, uh, Jake, for addressing this question. Um, very quick question to Chris. Um, why was the Russian Federation allowed to retain the USSR seat on the National Security Council after 1992? Quick I wonder answer. if yeah, I wonder if some of my colleagues uh, who know Russian history are, are would be uh, have a have an addendum to it. But the very big quick uh, answer is that Boris Yeltsin presented the paperwork, at, or as as did his um, the diplomats at the UN, and there really wasn't any debate that Russia would just said they would take over what the Soviet Union was doing at the UN, and they got the seat, and that that's it. That's the that's the bottom line. There there wasn't really any debate. There wasn't really much much thought about that in the moment, and it seemed the responsible course of action, uh, at least from my reading of that that late Cold War, early post-Cold War period history. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, one, I, I know um, um, we're running out of time, um, but maybe a few more questions. Uh, Sarah, I will address this one to you. Um, is Russian society capable of over, overthrowing Putin, as the goal of the sanctions seem to be? No. No. Mm -hmm. There are simply too many. Um... I mean, in, in theory, yes, but I would say there there's so many impediments to raise the costs on protest, as well as a very uneven playing field in terms of the information that citizens get. Um, that um, I, I think it would just be very hard. Yeah, it certainly is a, is a very tough question to answer, um, but um... I, I, I think um, there is so many underlying reasons why it would not be possible um, 
to agree with Sarah on that. Um, maybe uh, an open question to all the panelists uh, from Jenna. Um, what do you think is the worst case outcome of this war? What is the best case outcome? What gives you hope in the times like that? What is the worst outcome? What is the best outcome? Our worst outcome is that Ukraine is completely leveled. I'll, I'll go one worse than that. I mean, that is that is horrific, right. but uh, it would be a prolonged, protracted Vietnam style uh, right. Yeah. right insurgency conflict that that allows Ukraine to never again or not in the near term recover its breadbasket of Europe kind of um, capacities. And therefore, food costs in the world are also diminished. There's enormous human suffering. Refugees never get to come back. Right. E it, even if, if it were leveled, you could imagine a scenario a bit, but through which people would come back. Right. You could have a have a halfway vibrant society as horrific as that would be. So I, that's, uh, you know, the military people that I'm in touch with say that, you know, um, urban warfare is the one thing that modern militaries don't like to do, don't want to do. And and it's in, where, you know, the, the worst case scenario is sustained urban warfare over a long period of time. Everyone suffers. So hopefully somebody else can say something positive. Yeah. Any any good case scenarios? I guess the best case scenario is that sanctions are so, to my mind, is that sanctions are so effective that um, Putin either comes to the, to the realization that he needs to come up with an exit strategy that is much less than he originally wanted, um, and that um, involves some reparations to Ukraine, some concessions regarding neutrality, some, um, some combination of things, and that the Russian people, although they, I'm, I'm with Sarah, I don't think that there's any serious likelihood of a popular uprising uh, overthrowing Putin. But the Russian elections, parliamentary elections um, this September, could, you know, in a in a miracle in a miraculous world, could at least become less of a formality and change into something where people. Um, are able to register what undoubtedly is going to be growing discontent with the war if, it, if it's prolonged. I mean, just to tack on to what Julie said, you know, that 2024 is kind of the end of Putin's presidential term. So maybe, um, I mean, the problem is, is that you know, there's not really a sort of more touchy feely democratic alternative to Putin waiting in the wings, but at least if you want maybe a different potential negotiating partner 2014 is a potential, I mean 2024 is a potential time for change. Um, you know, I, I, I think what we're looking at right now is, I mean, concessions would be things like, um, you know, Crimea. Um, being recognized. I think Russia would accept Crimea as formally a part of Russia, but I think would still probably hold out for the Eastern Ukrainian Republic. So um, I, 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 I totally hear you about wanting hope, but I also, I get nervous that the media is almost showing this as like a Walt Disney movie and like there's going to be this incredible thing that happens. Um, and I think that's also equally dangerous that this is a really serious, horrible thing that's happening right now. And a lot is at stake. And 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 yeah, like we have to we have to find hope in terms of providing assistance and humanitarian aid. But I think it's also dangerous to kind of get too hyped up about like, yeah, and Starbucks is pulling out. Um this is a really bad situation. Sorry. Um. Um, thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, Philippe, would you like to address this question as well? I agree with um, all the pessimistic outlooks that are possible. I also would like to say that given that I, I've lived through the end of East Germany, we didn't know it would happen till it happened. Right. Dictatorships are very fragile. Um, the things that toppled um, 
the Polish dictatorship were Solidarność, were workers. Um, I've recently read that um, even under Yeltsin, it was coal worker strikes. Yeah, if the population, I mean, the population is holding to Putin because it has, he has succeeded in restoring some dignity as they see it and ha has given them a living. If that all evaporates now, I don't know, I'm, I agree this, whatever is happening will be fought on Ukraine, will be bought with the suffering of Ukrainians and a lot of death. I'm just, I, I have to be hopeful here. And we are seeing right now that Putin apparently intends to talk and talk and talk. And uh, there's probably a reason for that. Thank you, Philip. Um, there are questions about this possibly starting World War, World War III. Um, I think the um, hard to hard to answer questions. We don't want to, um, unless somebody wants to tackle this one. Um, is it possibly leading to the World War III? The Third World War. Oh, go ahead. No, this is Amy. I just wonder if Sergi would um, be willing to share briefly. He talked about this, um, about students joking about World War III um, in class today, and I thought he made a really helpful point. And on that note, Sergi, uh, one second. I would just uh, in, I want to inform everybody that I'm happy to uh, uh, lead this discussion to at least five forty-five. If you can stay, um, let's try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, thank you. So, Sergi, um, can you address that question? What do you um, what do you guys talk about in classrooms? Yeah. So, regarding Wall Street, theoretically, I think it can start at any moment. Putin just can press one button, and we all be in nuclear hands. But it's very very hard to estimate the possibility of such events. But at the current state, this war is definitely not a nuclear war. Sorry, not a World War Three. First of all, because Ukraine is mostly fighting in this alone against Russia and some other countries which help Russia to achieve their strategic advantages, such as Belarus and um, Chechnya, if we consider it as in the Russian state. So technically right now, it's not in, not, Russia is uh, not in the state of World War III because there is not, no, war, no world fighting it. It's just like several countries. And Ukraine is just opposing Russia by itself with all the support from Western countries. Thank you, Sergi. Um, very quick question to Chris, uh, directly addressed to Chris. Why are we hearing of, of uh, why are we hearing the term denazification? Some of my colleagues who know the Ukraine and the Russian story may, may um, uh, better appreciate this. I mean, the irony there is, of course, that Zelensky is a Jewish leader of a country that's aggressively anti-Nazi. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's palpable. And in fact, you know, if you if you look at some of that polling and public opinion um, information that Julia was suggesting, at least I've seen that that doesn't seem to resonate. That argument, the denazification doesn't seem to resonate. Um, but but it's a longer standing kind of critique. So I'll, I'll hand that over to um, to my colleagues. So I I think that it's, again, a situation of taking out of context um, some, you know, that, that the Putin administration is kind of snatching certain, the fact that there is the Azov Battalion, um, which is a, you know, it's a volunteer militia that includes a couple of neo-Nazis um, and is fighting on behalf of Ukraine. Um, so there's that. Um, I think this also has to do with the politics of history um, that have divided Russia and Ukraine. Um, and that includes uh, Ukraine's understanding of the Holodomor or the mass starvation um, famine of 1932-33. But um, much more divisively, it also includes Ukraine's independence movement during the Second World War. Um, and Philip talked about this a little bit, that the independence movement, um, Ukraine had freedom fighters, basically, who were um, hoping to achieve an independent Ukraine, independent from both Poland and the Soviet Union. Um, 
at the time of the, you know, they were hoping to use the turmoil of World War II to achieve that end. Um, but they were willing to partner up with the Nazis to do that. Um, there were members of the Ukrainian independence movement who collaborated in the Holocaust. There were members who um, engaged in genocide against Poles. And so it's actually been very poignant for me to see Poland's welcome of the refugees um, today. Um, and so I th there have been some issues when, for example, the Kiev City Council a couple of years ago uh, voted to rename Moscow Avenue um, Bandera Avenue. Um, this is a big arterial in Kiev. Um, Bandera was the head of one of the independence um, fighting movement, you know, the uh, fighter movements um, in World War II. And that's someone that in Soviet days and in a Russian point of view and in a Polish point of view was a war criminal. Um, when they, this is, I, I think that this is part of that story of Ukraine that, again, is kind of abstracted away from Zelensky with his Russian and Jewish background, um, uh, ethnically Russian, but personally citizenship Ukrainian, you know, background. I think it's a way of kind of sn taking these very specific moments um, and episodes and kind of blowing them way out of proportion. Uh, thank you, Julie. I think you also touched upon one of the other questions and um, about the component of uh, the fascist element in the Ukrainian revolutions, the Azov's battalion that you've mentioned. Um, um, let's, uh, I, 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 I think you used the phrase, uh, 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 it's a, a, an element, right? It's, it's just a, um, a fraction. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, um, the question I was asking about um, whether there is any truth to that, that the revolutions were supported by fascists too. So to conclude uh, the answer, uh, I think in accordance with your answer, uh, to a certain extent, the, to uh, in, in some small portions, right? There was a fascist element, right? Um, uh, so there's a few uh, uh, more questions um, that I think there's more coming right now. Um, Media repression. Uh, what impact of uh, Russian media repression do you think plays in this? And what do you think about the impact this war will have on Russians in Russia? Uh, Julie or Sarah? I think Sarah's gone, so I'll say something. Okay. Of course, media repression has been a, um, has has been a part of Putin's increasingly authoritarian regime. Uh, particularly since his third presidential term, which started in 2012. But from the beginning, it's part of it. Uh, it's just been intensified. And so, of course, the ability of Russians to obtain accurate information is seriously compromised. On the other hand, uh, 11 million Russians have family, close family members living in, who are in, you, you, in Ukraine, um, Ukrainian citizens, um, many more millions of Russians have family members and close friends and so on, connections in the United States and Israel and Western Europe, um, in Poland, in, in other places. And so I think that that attempt to cordon Russians off from um, all news outside the bubble of um, Putin's controlled media, I. I don't think it can be fully successful, especially for the urban population that's likely to be more connected. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you for your answer. I think we have time for two more questions. So um, let me just uh, ask, um, a debate is uh, Annette's question. A debate is raging over closing the airspace. Can you give us some clarity on the likelihood of consequences of such a decision? Would it bring us closer to nuclear war, as some suggests? Nick, uh, Chris? Uh, I'd love to hear Jake's comments too, um, and anyone else, but uh, I think it undoubtedly increases the chances of an accident that could lead to a heightened conflict. That's a no-fly zone is war. It means knocking down things in the air if they're flown by a belligerent country. Bottom line, dr drones, planes, uh, pick your helicopters. Um, so it's not a benign act. 
um, sanctions are also belligerent, right? They, they harm people. Sanctions policies are intended to coerce. Uh, you know, you can think about examples like some of the chemicals needed that are you know, not allowed to be transmitted to nations are also, you know, useful in medicines, right? Um, or in factories that are needed for baby food. You know, there are a lot of examples like this. Sanctions hurt. They're intended to hurt. They're not benign. Uh, and the same thing with no-fly zones. And a no-fly zone with a major nuclear power has never been tried in, in you know, history. Um, and I think people are right to be very cautious about that, uh, to really fundamentally achieve uh, either parity in the space over Ukraine um, or to figure out a way to have no one flying except rescue missions uh, would entail significant risk. Um, and that risk would be to expand the fight. It depends who's doing it. Uh, you could imagine some other, perhaps a non-NATO country attempting to be a par participant in that. Um, but if you had any, uh, any country part of a collective security bloc that was pledged to support another country, you can just imagine how that might expand. Um, and I'll just add one more thing. I, I, I suggested we think about historical comparisons and a few people added these in their comments, mine would be that the world of this moment is a lot like the late 19th century or the world preceding World War I. Um, and if you think about it that way, the kind of cascade effect of mistakes, mistaken apprehensions uh, and possible conflicts, um, you know, is often uh, embodied in the metaphor of a tinderbox. And a no-fly zone to me is like lighting a match awfully close to a tinderbox. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jake? No just a brief uh, comment on that. And that, you know, I was reading this New York Times editorial, I think it was this morning, Thomas Friedman talking about possible, possible nuclear war and desperate, desperate moves by Putin and how that's scary and et cetera. Uh, and I'm sure we've all had those conversations, uh, but I just wanna also with the historical reminders, that there are many ways for this war to be widened short of nuclear war. Uh, and, uh, most of us here grew up in the Cold War. There are plenty of wars going on there that uh, that the United States was involved in, and so was the Soviet Union, in which there was conflict, um, short of nuclear war. Uh, so I, I think that um, there is sort of a, a missing step between the, the world is ending and the current uh, war in, in Ukraine that I don't know if we're, we're necessarily acknowledging that it could be very bad and very destructive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily involve nuclear weapons. That's all I have to say. Another element to be on the lookout for is that humanitarian relief workers can be targeted in these kinds of conflicts, as can peacekeepers. And so if you see near-term stages where the conflict seems to be moving towards some kind of um, human rights orientation, a, a yet another danger zone is when you have, you know, UN folks in blue helmets or any attempts to control airspace so that you can evacuate people or bring in much needed, you know, material. That's another thing to worry about. As Jake's noting, it doesn't need to become nuclear for it to be, be a widened conflict. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Chris, uh, for addressing this question. I think this plays in, into uh, yet uh, the future panel that Amy is is working on on migrations and and refugees crisis and humanitarian aid, um, this strikes close home. Uh, my family on the eastern border of Poland is very much involved in helping um, the stream of refugees from Ukraine. I would, I would I want to ask one more question since few people are interested in this one, uh, and that will be our last one uh, if you allow me. Um, I wish I could open the floor for the panelists to ask each other questions. Um, but this is not, this, we're already uh, way over time. Um, what is keeping Putin's cronies at his side? Could a tipping point be sanctions which threaten their wealth? This is the question asked by Miriam and a uh, few other people are interested in the answer here. So let's think, let's imagine that um, um, Putin's friends leave him for some reason. Would that happen? Is it a possibility? How would that happen? Philip, thank you. There's a scene in the movie, The Death of Stalin, um, during which um, Beria dominates uh, the whole movie almost, uh, the head of the Secret Service, but eventually he goes too far and you see how like a pack of wolves, everybody piles on him. What you've seen Putin do is to force his, as you say, cronies to publicly declare allegiance to his plan. So he made sure that they are somehow all in. 
However, the way this happened was clearly so manipulative. Allegedly, the Kremlin used to employ a pair, no, a, a person who handed out clean pants because of hiring officials would come into, into the Kremlin and then be so scared by the leadership that they had to have a change of pants. There's a climate of fear, um, also a complicity, a false complicity. But I, I, I do believe in, if, if you annoy enough people that are close to you, look at the history of Roman emperors. This, uh, the Praetorian Guards was probably always the source of getting rid of an emperor. Uh, so if, you, if, if these people that support Putin, if their interests are constantly violated, if their long-term interest in maintaining the country that they still are interested in running, if that keeps being violated, I, I, I think the person that is most afraid right now is actually Putin, even though that sounds horrible to say in the face of Ukrainians dying, but I wouldn't underestimate that a lot of what you're seeing right now is based on the fear that he has on how this ends for him. He has put himself into a corner since 2014. He had a chance actually the Monday before he declared war to say, okay, Donetsk, Luhansk in its current borders, Crimea and good riddance. That was, was his out, that he didn't do this. Uh, it still confuses me. It can only be because something is pushing him or some really deep nationalist conviction. Look at what um, Petra Kirill is saying. And all of these statements about there being neo-Nazis or fascists in Ukraine, look what Putin and Kirill are saying, the homophobia, the absolute rejection of the West, the tie between military, orthodox, uh, Russian church, industrialism. So this tells you who here really follows a fascist playbook. But um, you have enough people here probably also wanting self-preservation. Thank you, Philippe. Um... Is there anybody else who would like to add to that question and to Philip's answer? I have one thought that I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, we've never been in this globally interconnected of a community of nations and non-state actors who can take sanctions into their own hands. A, a, lot, a number of people have been writing about this. So you, you, we have the formal nation state sanctions regime um, and, and, and that it's remarkable what's going on now, taking Russian banks off SWIFT. I mean, you know, really rapidly isolating the country, but you also have all kinds of businesses, multinational corporations, individuals, hacker groups like Anonymous have, have come out against Russia. There are a lot of ways in which this coercion can, you know, can certainly hit the cronies or the oligarchs, but also have really wide and deep impacts across society in the ways that Philip was noting you know, coal, from coal miners to billionaires in ways that we've, we've not seen kind of formal and informal sanction regimes ever function. Um, so there's really no way to know how long the cronies and regular citizens will, will come along with Russia. But, you know, the ruble is basically worthless right now. Um, the people, you know, you're seeing things, amazing stories like the mechanic on a yacht trying to sink the yacht, turning himself in and then joining the Ukrainian defense. Uh, you know, I mean, how many examples like that need to go on before a whole lot of different types of constituencies within a society, not just the Praetorian Guard, but the, you know, the rank and file uh, turn on him. I mean, it's, it's, I think Philip is exactly right that, that some part of Putin is deeply afraid right now. And the, and the kinds of formal and informal sanctions that are out in the world and that can endure beyond the formal sanctions of nation states should really be worrying him if he's, if he's fully cognizant of, of what the dimensions of those are. Oh, trying to uh, dive into the psyche of Putin. Um, I am, uh, I, I am uh, constrained by time right here, and um, I think I need to, I uh, need to finish. Uh, I need to close this panel uh, while thanking uh, all of you in the audience and all the uh, excellent panelists for taking their time and uh, joining us today on this uh, absolutely important issue um, that's uh, influencing, already influencing all of us one way or the other, right? And um, hopefully we can continue the conversation and hopefully we can continue our support uh, to students like Sergi and uh, we will try to do our best. Uh, just to, uh, I would want to let you know in the name of uh, Amy and myself and the whole, the, the whole body of 
concerned faculty at uh, School of History, Philosophy, Religion that we are here for you and we will try to reach out uh, in ways uh, that we can to support um, our students of uh, Ukraine and Russia as well, actually. Um, Amy, would you like to uh, say a few words at the end? Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you to everyone and thank you, Marta, for being such a good moderator. Um, be well, everyone. <laughs>